Welcome to Portal to the Past, a short history podcast to teach you about the important historical events that are often left out of the school curriculum. I'm Evie and I'm currently studying history at A-level. Today we'll be discussing the rise and fall of Agrippina, who's interesting because she was widely regarded as the most powerful woman in ancient Rome. Now, to begin with, Agrippina was immediately born into a powerful lineage. She was a great granddaughter to the revered Augustus, who was a really powerful Roman emperor and left a really powerful legacy behind him. And she was also the daughter of Germanicus, who had been named as one of two of Augustus' chosen successors. So he, too, was a very powerful man in the Roman Empire. However, she had a very turbulent childhood and her father died when she was just a young child and it was widely suspected that Tiberius, who was the current emperor, had played a part in this. Soon afterwards, Tiberius also arrested Agrippina's mother, Agrippina the Elder, and she was put in prison where she died along with two of Agrippina's brothers. So at the age of 13, Agrippina had lost both of her parents and was now married off to a cruel and domineering aristocrat named Aheno Barbus. However, Agrippina's early misfortune seemed to be reversed in 37 AD when her brother Caligula became emperor. He elevated her status and showered her with luxuries. And this is also when she gave birth to her only son, originally called Lucius Demetius Ahenobarbus, but he would later become known as the powerful Emperor Nero. However, following the death of one of Agrippina's sisters, Claudius grew very suspicious suspicious of Agrippina and her other younger sister and they were both exiled to a Mediterranean island where she remained for the rest of Caligula's rule. Once again Caligula's assassination and replacement with Claudius acted as a reversal of her fortunes. Claudius was Agrippina's paternal uncle and he allowed her to return to Rome and at this point she knew that she held a really powerful position. Claudius wasn't expected to survive long, and Rome needed heirs with bloodlings to Augustus. However, Claudius, who was married to Messalina, therefore could consider Nero, who was um, Agrippina's son, as a heir. However, this led Messalina to become suspicious of Agrippina and her sister, because she was obviously aware of this threat that um, Agrippina posed to her. And this led her to kind of try and solidify her position however it was actually Agrippina's younger sister who was punished instead of Agrippina and she was once again exiled to a Mediterranean island but Agrippina escaped this and this time during the first period of exile Agrippina's first husband had died so she married again but this second husband also died soon after and this left her in a position of wealth It is now that rumours began to circulate regarding Agrippina, ones which you may have heard of before with her being very kind of portrayed as a seductress and evil Roman woman. There is a debate as to how accurate this portrayal of her was because it is certainly something that the Romans could have exaggerated as they enjoyed a tale of a young, evil, scheming woman and they were just suspicious of a young woman whose rich husband seemed to have had this pattern of dying. However, that doesn't discredit them completely, as it does become clear later in Agrippina's life that she certainly knew how to manipulate her sexuality to her advantage. So it remains something that divides historians as to the extent of the truth behind this portrayal of Agrippina. Now, with uh, Messalina, Claudius had a son named Britannicus, And this obviously did pose a threat to Agrippina's hope of her son becoming emperor. However, this didn't completely ruin her chances of what would be Nero's um, seizing power. Because many thought that Claudius wouldn't survive long enough for Britannicus to reach a suitable age. As Britannicus was a few years younger than Nero and also Claudius was fairly old and he had health issues. So there was still a chance for Nero to that he would be more suitable than Britannicus and therefore would become emperor. Also, the Romans wanted um, an heir who descended directly from Augustus and Nero and Agrippina's lineage was um, a lot more direct than Britannicus's. In the AD 40s, Messalina started to become sexually promiscuous and she openly took lovers and this was widely seen as behaviour that was not acceptable for a princess. And this also cast doubt over the legitimacy of Britannicus and also his sister Olivia. 
When Messalina took part in this strange ceremony in which she claimed to have wed another husband, not the emperor, Claudius turned against her and she was forced to commit suicide and this severely tarnished Britannicus's reputation, which obviously was a chance for Agrippina and Nero. And this is when Agrippina really set to work securing her son's position of power. She married Claudius in AD 49 and Claudius was actually forced to get an act of Senate that made marriages between uncles and nieces legal. There is still debate as to who the principal instigator of this marriage was as some argue that Agrippina seduced Claudius into it purely just to get Nero into a position of power where others suggest that Claudius carefully selected her because he knew that she would solidify his position. What was clear was that Agrippina was certainly going to rule as her husband's equal and wasn't going to take the typical rule of a woman and kind of be subservient. She took a public position and she forced the Roman people to accept that they were being ruled over by a woman, which was very unstereotypical. She also sat on a throne and wore the colours of gold and purple, which were traditionally only worn by the emperor. Immediately, Agrippina also set to work on solidifying her power. She got a tutor for Nero in order to train him and get him ready to become emperor. And she also reappointed the staff of the Praetorian Guard. And this was like the army in ancient Rome. And this really ensured that they were loyal and allegiant to her, which was a very powerful force to have behind her. Claudius also officially adopted Demetrius in AD 40. And this is actually when he became Nero as a part of the new set of names he was given. At this point, um, Nero was older than Britannicus. He always had been, he was three years older. And this is when the process of his maturing into adulthood began to be hurried, which was arguably through Agrippina's heavy involvement. He was awarded a toga a year earlier than usual in AD 52 at the age of 13. And this is obviously not the usual practice. So highlighted this kind of desperation for him to come of age and therefore be considered a more suitable ruler. And he was also married to Octavia a year later. For a while, under this rule with Agrippina and Claudius, there was a period of stability. There weren't really any major coups or conflicts. But as Britannicus grew older, he became more and more of a threat to Nero's claim for succession because he was reaching the age where he would be considered emperor um, and he was old enough to do so. In late AD 54, when Britannicus was soon to turn 13, which is significant as that was the age when Nero's maturing into adulthood began. So this is when he really started to pose a threat to Nero and Agrippina's claim for power. Um, it was then that Claudius died after eating a dish of mushrooms at a dinner party and became violently ill. Agrippina, however, hid his death until the following noon, and then she sent Nero out while keeping Britannicus kept out of the way in his bedchambers, and Nero was appointed princeps or emperor, despite only being 16. And this is another area where conspiracy surrounds Agrippina. There's debate as to whether she was responsible for Claudius's death. The timing is very convenient to her, particularly considering Britannicus nearing the age of 13. And it is clear that she has a personality that was capable of such an act. But still, modern historians remain divided as to whether it really was her. Now, being largely responsible for Nero's rise to power, Agrippina intended to claim her share. And she travelled with two attendants and a bodyguard. The Praetorians still listened to her commands. And she also arranged for the Senate to meet in a place where she could listen behind a curtain. And this ensured that she had an extensive knowledge of what was going on in Rome and meant she could share power with Nero effectively. This was arguably the peak of her power and she almost acted as a co-ruler to Nero. Initially, Nero seemed to be agreement, in agreement and there's evidence that they kind of did share this kind of co-ruler status together. Obviously, Nero was emperor, but Agrippina certainly had a sizable portion of the power. And this is evident in how they're both depicted on coins of the time, often pictured facing each other with their heads being equal sizes. However, this stability was certainly short lasting. Nero had been forced to marry Octavia, but he held no affection towards her and actually he rather disliked her. And he became instead involved with Act, who was a Greek ex-slave in the palace staff. However, this enraged Agrippina 
um, because she didn't see this as a suitable match for Nero. But Nero responded by having her chief partisan retire from politics, which is basically a symbol of him asserting his dominance over her. With the amount of power that she had been used to holding, this really infuriated Agrippina. And in her rage, she vowed to have Nero replaced by Britannicus using the Praetorians or the army, which actually was a real threat because they did have extensive allegiance to her. So this did worry Nero. A few weeks later, Britannicus was poisoned on Nero's orders. And this was, again, a symbol of his independence and willingness to stray from his mother at this point. He, um, Agrippina was thrown out of the palace and her bodyguard was removed and the people of Rome were definitely made aware that she was no longer in favour. So this was really the beginning of Nero starting to move away from the influence that his mother had, um, had held over him. For the next few years, Agrippina, she retired a bit into the background. Not much was heard from her and she retired to a family estate. But just because she had kind of gone silent for a little bit, it didn't mean that Nero's fear of her disappeared. She clearly was a powerful woman and she liked her share of power. In his 20s, Nero entered another relationship, this time with someone called Poppia Sabina. And again, Agrippina attempted to dissuade him because, again, she didn't see this match as suitable. Some ancient sources even claim that she began an incestuous affair with him trying to ensure his allegiance to her over his new matches but this didn't work and Poppy really wanted to become empress and she eventually persuaded Nero to kill his mother and he resolved to do this in 59 AD. In order to do this Nero built a trick boat which was designed to collapse and sink with Agrippina on board. After a grand dinner party which he hosted for her on an island he sent his mother home on this boat hoping that it would sink and kill her. However, the boat failed to sink properly and Agrippina managed to swim ashore, which Nero wasn't counting on. This caused Nero to panic because obviously it was clear what had happened and he needed to now dispose of her quickly. So he sent soldiers to her house to kill her, but ever the powerful woman that she was, Agrippina still stood her ground. Originally, she tried to argue that her son would never have ordered her death and tell the people who had been sent to kill her that this wasn't possible and they'd made a mistake and they shouldn't kill her. But it soon became clear that her death was inevitable. But instead of giving in, she bared her womb and ancient sources describe her final words to be along the lines of, strike here at the place that produced such a monster. So even in death, she refused to give up her power and she still remained that powerful and strong figure. She was cremated and buried in an unmarked grave, but that's not to say that the legacy of Agrippina died with her. She came to be actually a crucial element of Nero's downfall. Plotters against him later cited her murder as their principal mo motive for wanting to overthrow him. And this was then repeated by subsequent rebellious legions who eventually were the ones to force him to commit suicide. Overall, throughout her life and even in her death, Agrippina held power in many different forms and she was an extremely powerful woman. However, there were also quite a few controversies surrounding her life. One of the key ones being whether she did in fact murder her husband. Now, I'm, I'll give you my opinion. Obviously, you don't have to take this and believe it because it's certainly not professional and simply just based on the research that I've done. But I personally believe that she did murder her husband. There's a lot of kind of medical and historical evidence that's been uncovered now suggesting that the mushrooms did create a toxin and the toxin that's been named actually fits with many of the painful symptoms that Claudius experienced in his death because it was a particularly painful death. And also the timing seems very convenient because Britannicus was just reaching that age where he began to become a threat to Agrippina. So it seems very convenient that it was at this point that Claudius died, just as Nero kind of had his last chance to get power. And also the fact that she concealed the death kind of lends itself to being an orchestrated plot, suggesting she did know something about it. Obviously, that is just my opinion. Another controversy surrounding her, as there certainly were many, was how 
the incestuous marriage between Agrippina and Claudius came about. In my opinion, I kind of think that it was a bit of a mix, really. I think there was elements of Agrippina's seduction, but I also think that Claudius did know that it would improve his power. There were certainly some of um, Claudius's advisors who favoured Agrippina and advised him to do it, and he did know that it would put him in a secure position because it provided him with a more legitimate heir in Nero than Britannicus was. However, there is also evidence to suggest that this was certainly supported by Agrippina's efforts at charming him. There's lots of records of her frequently visiting him and winning his heart over in order to marry her. And also, some reports suggest that she behaved in a more intimate manner than was to be expected of a niece. Um, and some arguing that their relationship was sexual in nature even before their marriage. But again, there, that could be rumours. But I definitely think Claudius did want to do it to some extent because he did have to go to the effort of having laws changed. So he did go to effort to marry her, which I think suggests that there was some reason for wanting to do so on his part. And finally, I think the overall debate that surrounds Agrippina is whether she really was the seductress that sources portrayed her to be. And again, I think this is a bit of a mix because there's clear evidence throughout her life that she did know how to manipulate her sexuality to her advantage. But I definitely think that the Romans were ones who would particularly have enjoyed this tale of such like an evil and scheming woman. And I think there definitely would have been some exaggeration on their parts, particularly in the earlier years before she married Claudius and it was just that her husbands were dying. I, To me, it seems as if the seductress nature of her betrayal there is certainly over-exaggerated. But as I said, I don't think it's completely fabricated as there does seem to be some evidence to support this kind of nature in her. Also, I think the Romans potentially could have fabricated it because I just don't think they'd particularly know how to react to a woman with such powerful ambitions she behaved very unstereotypically for her time and I don't think Romans would be used to this and therefore that's when these rumors began to circulate so that is a brief summary of Agrippina's life and the many controversies that surround her she certainly was a very interesting character in the Roman period arguably the most powerful woman and it's interesting to consider if she had been born a man, the story of her life may have been very different to the one that we've just been through. And whether if she was a man, she could have been one of the most mighty leaders of the Roman Empire, because she certainly possessed the qualities for it. She just had the misfortune, you may argue, of being born a woman. So that concludes the first podcast for my series. Um, I hope you enjoyed and check out my channel for more podcasts, which should hopefully start to appear regularly. Thank you for listening.